the uh, agenda for today looks like this. You know, we'll talk about some reflections on 2020, then a few comments about the uh, the portfolio, and before we move on to the outlook, and then we have had a few uh, pre-submitted questions that we'll go through in addition to anything that you may answer uh, during the uh, the webcast. So with that, we'll dive right into to reflections on, on 2020, and um, we think this kind of slide summarizes what's been going on in the market. Obviously, I mean, the corona crisis has been the, the number one thing, followed by the unprecedented shutdowns that have um, uh, impacted the Western world uh, throughout the year. And of course, the US presidential election with Biden uh, coming into the office, and finally kind of the past few weeks, you know, we've had a debate beginning to simmer around uh, the reflation trade and maybe inflation is going to come back as we as we look forward. Um, so that's what we come to, to summarize on a very high level of the things. Um, if we look at the market, this graph will show you the uh, the uh, uh, world index and, and we just kind of want to highlight again the uh, extremely sort of sharp movement both on the downside and the upside uh, in back in March when we had you know, probably one of the fastest crashes in the market and then the, uh, the extremely speedy recovery uh, back up again and that, that took a lot of people by, by surprise. Now, if we look at uh, on the sector level for the index, what has happened uh, during the year and we split the year into two halves, kind of the first part being pre the crash in March and the second one being post the crash. And if we look at how things kind of reacted um, up until the market bottomed on March 23rd, we had the following picture. This is all measured in, in Euro. And uh, the blue line kind of shows you everything that outperformed compared to the index in the different sectors. And below the blue line, you have the sectors that underperformed during this time period. Um, so finance, materials, energy being in the bottom, staples, healthcare, communication services, kind of maybe as you would expect sort of in the uh, <coughs> better performing sectors in the, uh, in the downdraft. Now, then, if we look at what happened during the recovery phase, so from March 23rd and onwards, then the picture obviously looks different where you've had a very strong recovery driven by consumer discretionary, the material sector, technology and industrials. And I mean, the more maybe defensive ones have maybe, as you would expect, lagged behind uh, the rest of the market. So it means if you look at kind of taking the whole year, so year to date, um, we have the following picture, again measured in euros, where we had outperformance from these four sectors seen over the entire year, and we've had finance, real estate, energy being the bottom ones um, so far at least. And interestingly, kind of if you look at again, if you think about those uh, two sections, kind of pre and post the crash. Um, it's interesting that technology and consumer discretionary, they actually outperformed both before and after uh, the actual crash. Whereas the three sort of worst sectors, finance, real estate and energy, they were losers. I mean, they were below uh, the index on the sector level, both uh, before the crash and, and after the crash. And that has, of course, has implications for um, the stocks um, that have uh, driven kind of the market and the performance uh, since since then. Another thing that may be worth just a short comments on the, the oil price. And you know, we had that uh, the very steep fall again back here. Oil went all the way down and um, come toward the uh, the twenty dollar range for the Brent oil. Since then it has it has come back uh, strongly. But remember energy still one of the worst performing sectors uh, you know, during the year. And then we take a longer view, like you know, at Skagen Global, you know, we like to, to look at things on a multi-year view, ideally a decade and maybe even more sometimes. Um, we see kind of oil at 50 now, uh, sort of well below the levels that we've seen over the past, uh, for most of the past decade um, 
And that, of course, also has implications for the market in the sense that the oil sector, the energy sector, is becoming increasingly irrelevant, or at least very small in a in a in a kind of a, in an index context. So this graph shows you for the American for the S and P 500 index, the weight of the energy sector is now only two percent. Quite a dramatic shift from being sort of in the in the low teens, you know, roughly a a, a decade ago. Um, so that's sort of an interesting observation from the year and how this downward trend has has continued. The other thing that's going to again maybe stating the obvious, but obviously we've had another kind of step down in in interest rates. Um, this one shows you in light blue here the German ten-year government bond yield sort of continuing to to be actually below zero, and um, uh, you know, we've seen kind of corporate yields coming down as well. And if we think about the U.S. ten-year, which is not shown on this slide, but it came down all the way to I think roughly 0.5 percent before it recovered a bit and is currently you know in the 0.9 uh, percent roughly uh, as we as we speak. And all this is of course driven by the fact that we've had tremendous amounts of of uh, debt being added to um, balance sheets, both of central banks and governments in the Western world. This graph shows you the uh, Federal Reserve's balance sheet and how they have gone from about $4 trillion to now $7 trillion uh, after the actions they took to prop up the market and provide liquidity. Uh, as you know, we had the uh, crash going on in 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 March. So uh, again, very high levels of debt added by central banks, by government support programs, and we think that this is maybe the most important reflection from the market as a whole, given that it changes the dynamics, um, it changes fundamentals for some companies, uh, and of course, it is sort of in uncharted territory given this huge amount of printing money and uh, and I guess no one knows for sure what this is going to lead to uh, in the next months, years and decades. So those were kind of a few, a few comments there and then we'll move on to the um, the next section, namely the Skagen Global Portfolio. And just to be clear, I mean we have still the same framework that we've been presenting to you for, for the past uh, few years you know that we look very much bottom up. Um, we have an unconstrained mandate where we value to have companies with kind of long term fundamentals that need to be attractive. Companies should have a competitive advantage, good cash flow, strong balance sheet, um, management that we are, you know, that we think are both sort of skilled and have integrity. And finally, the companies need to be undervalued in the way that we think about valuation, which which we'll come come back to. So no change at all from that level. And here is another slide then that we have also shown you a number of times, um, namely an illustrative slide, uh, just kind of picturing how we sort of graphically expect the fund to perform over time. Yeah, so kind of over a multi-year time period, we sort of expect this type of relative performance, you know, illustratively speaking. And, and as we have said, um, you know, it's not going to be a straight line. It will be up and it will be periods when the fund goes down compared to the index. Um, and maybe when you had a, a good run, then you, know, you tend to gloss over that part. But the fact is that the past few months we've kind of been in this part. Yeah, after having had a, you know, a few years of, sort of better performance, yeah, we've not hit a bit of a soft spot or a rough patch here. And, um, and the fund has you know, had a, a weak period, which we'll come in and talk about the reason for that. But the takeaway is that you know this is something that is you know sort of to be expected in the market. Um, there's never going to be sort of a linear kind of exactly upward sloping line. It will be ups and downs, uh, and uh, uh, but over time, obviously, you know, there should be more ups than downs. So to sort of a uh, 
reiterate that message. I mean, the fund, if we go back to, to May, the fund was almost 4% in euro um, ahead of the benchmark. Then when you fast forward six months to the end of November, you know, it was reversed. I mean, then the fund had fallen back by kind of roughly the same, the same amount. So clearly a, a negative uh, development during that time period. And of course, I mean, that's something that is um, uh, painful for the portfolio managers, for the clients. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's understandable that people want to know, you know, what is behind this. And, and we'll kind of show you, you know, a couple of things that have driven the, the um, uh, recent underperformance. One thing that has had sort of big implications, where at least cost us probably, you know, in the neighborhood of 3% percentage points on the undervalue, underperformance is our exposure to two specialty insurers, namely Hiscox and, and Beastly. Um, for them, the coronavirus ended up being sort of a, the, uh, the worst case scenario because in many ways they are specialty insurers, meaning that they insure specialty events. Could be, for example, sport events, concerts, uh, you know, uh, small businesses. So basically things that have for the first time since World War II completely shut down in the Western world. Yeah, so that means you have to obviously pay out money and kind of make it to the policyholders. So that has been a clear negative for, for the companies. And what's more is the fact that even today as we sit here, we don't know, you know, how are things going to develop with the lockdowns over the next months or quarters or who knows, maybe even 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 years. Um, so it means that you still have an uncertainty around these stocks. So while they came down, they have essentially stayed down. They haven't been part of the recovery that we have seen in some other names in the financial sector. Um, so it's, it is, of course, a sort of a disappointing development. Um, it is uh, in a bit, in a way, unfortunate that you had exactly this type of event happen, but that has happened, and um, uh, we no longer hold these companies. We have sold them, given that there is still so much uncertainty, and um, uh, there is no kind of clear way um, that the recovery is going to kind of be as we expected before as part of the investment case, uh, given that you've had a fundamental shift to the to the downside or to the negative side for these names. So that's kind of one, one part that is material for the underperformance. Um, second part, over the past few weeks, uh, we've had a bit of a, what we call a, a catch-up rally in the market. Basically since late, late October, that has been a called a bit of a rotation or a value rally in the market. And that has been something that we have not participated in on a relative basis uh, as much as, as um, uh, the index. And I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next the next couple of slides. Um, small, maybe positive though sign in the midst of this is that the new holdings that we have entered into the fund throughout the year, they have sort of done done well so far and uh, we think there's a long runway in these cases meant that they can be in the portfolio for, for a long time and uh, still good risk reward, good upside in, in those names. Now, kind of going back to comment a bit more about this rotation that happened lately in the market, um, just going to illustrate why we haven't sort of been, been uh, participating strongly in that rally. And uh, for that, we have looked at the MSCI world, uh, all countries, and we looked at the time period when this rally took place, 31st of October to the 4th of December. And then we have picked out among the top 80 performers, so the best relative performers during that time period. We've picked out the companies that we think you are familiar with. So instead of kind of taking out or choosing to show you obscure Chinese names. These are sort of the names from the from Europe uh, and, and other US. I mean that we think you may be more familiar with to illustrate the point that we're going to make. 
So during this short time period, you've had an immense rally. I mean, this, this is the, the relative outperformance that they have shown compared to the index. You know, enormous sort of good numbers for such a short time period. However, if you look at the performance year to date, so until the 4th of December for these stocks, most of them have had poor, or you might even say very poor performance compared to the index. Yeah. So of course, I mean, they were even more depressed before the rally, but even after this spectacular rally, they are poor performers. And if you take a longer view, like we do in Skagen Global, and you look, you know, how have these performed maybe on a three year view, on a five year view, or even on a 10 year view, again, you will note that many, not all of them, to be clear, but many of them have been very poor performers from a relative perspective. I mean, you would not want us to have these names kind of stuffed in the portfolio if you're a long term holder. And the reason is that many of these companies, again, not all of them, but many of them have pretty poor business models. They don't make it into our framework and therefore we wouldn't own them. That means, of course, it can be painful when you have this type of sharp catch up, sharp rotation in, a, in the market. But over time, we believe that that is a good, um, the reason that is better not to hold them than to hold them. And you can kind of see here, even though it's backward looking, why kind of that view hopefully intuitively makes sense to you. So that's kind of part of you know, why we've been, been, been uh, um, uh, losing some of the performance relative terms over the past few weeks. So moving on, I'm just going to highlight what, what has worked, what hasn't worked. I mean, we've talked a lot about what has not worked the kind of worst performers in absolute terms uh, for the first 11 months, Beasley, Hiscox, the insurers, as well as the bank JP Morgan. Um, that was the only bank we had in the portfolio. On the positive side, we've had uh, Microsoft Adobe uh, benefiting from, from, of course, some of the digital work, but also from the strong market positions, as well as a Danish logistics company DSV is an asset light, uh, very operationally strong uh, company and that has executed well and also benefited from some of the higher freight rates that we've seen during the year. They're also a part of the portfolio going forward. Looking at some of the changes in the fund, I uh, won't kind of go through them in detail, but, but you know, some of the things that we have added during the year, uh, intuitive surgical, the uh, robotic platform for, for doing surgeries, ASML, uh, essentially a monopoly when it comes to making uh, machines for um, the production of certain memory and semiconductors, MSCI, sort of a, a um, bit of a flywheel operator that we have um, that uh, is essentially an essential part of asset management, very strong uh, position essentially a monopoly uh, in, in, in its own um, field. I'll come back to, to Equinor later. And as we've sold them, we've kind of talked about these companies before. Um, but I mean, the point that I wanted to make about the kind of the bank and, and the insurers, again, going back to this graph, when we talked about all this debt being added in, in the world, again, this is just the US, but I mean, same picture for most Western countries, is that we believe that if you take a multi-year horizon looking forward from here, fundamentals for financials have deteriorated, meaning that insurers and banks look to have a much steeper hill to climb now compared to a year ago. Yeah. And that essentially means that we have chosen to exit all our holdings that are um, in, in, in banks and in the insurance sector. The last point I just wanted to make on this page where you have Equinor both in and out is, as we've said, um, we have an unconstrained mandate. Uh, for the most part, we look to own companies that can kind of be in the portfolio 
compound in value over long periods of time. But if there is a specific event where you have a clear dislocation in price in the market, then we have uh, we're happy to go in and take advantage of that. Back in the spring, when you had oil price collapsing, we did a contrarian move. We went in, we bought up some some Equinor, and then when the share price you know, came back after the panic had subsided, uh, then we also exited given that it reached our target price and we did not see it as being a long term compounding story. Uh, so that can happen, but it's rare occasions uh, when you have sharp market dislocations. The way the portfolio looks now, this is Skagen Global in blue. The index in green. And as you can see, you know, we have a number of sectors where we have zero exposure in the fund. Um, and if you look at the financials and you're thinking, you know, why do you have 22% if you don't have any banks or insurance companies? The reason is that we have some other companies, these ones, for example, that we believe are more um, technology and in some cases professional services companies. So we argue that they are misclassified by the index. But again, thinking about our agnostic index agnostic approach as an active manager, where the index puts them, to us it doesn't really matter. I mean, to us what matters is that the company is well positioned to generate value over time. Uh, but we just wanted to highlight that part to, to make it clear to you. And the top 10 list um, with some of the key metrics. And as we usually say when we show this, uh, what we talk about qualitatively for the fund should also be reflected quantitatively. So in other words, when we talk about having a competitive advantage, having a strong balance sheet, that must also be reflected in the numbers. And we think that it's clear from these numbers, if you look at, for example, an operating margin, EBIT margin, return on equity, the fund shows far better profitability than what you have in the index. And equally on the balance sheet side, net debt, EBITDA, interest rate coverage, uh, uh, you know, again, you have you have the fund having much better numbers, much more robust financials overall compared to the index. And of course, that also means that when you have these type of cyclical rallies, you know, you're not going to participate as much with these sort of stronger balance sheet names. That's the kind of trade off that you make. Uh, it also means that of course, if you have a bad recession hitting, you're not going to have to worry about your companies going bankrupt or being in, in, in a deep death spiral. So then kind of moving on to the outlook uh, to say a few words about 2021 as we've been asked to do. And uh, this is sort of about the, the macro side uh, regions, you know, what are we seeing on valuation and so forth? Um, always sort of uh, uh, insight, some, some interest. And before we go into this, you know, we just wanted to give you a reminder that we are bottom up. We look at the companies and you know assess them individually. We don't make macro predictions and then try to find companies fitting those macro predictions. So what I'm talking about in the next section, keep in mind that does you know some some broad thoughts um, that we you know reflect upon, think about from a risk framework, but it's not the um, uh, the main or the primary driver of our portfolio, which is obviously different. So with that caveat kind of diving in here, um, this is the latest fund manager survey. It came out this morning um, from Bank of America, and this one shows, you know, it's essentially you know, kind of a compilation of a few hundred global fund managers uh, that's being done to kind of show how they on average think about the world. And what we can see is that there's been a rotation over the past month into emerging markets, into some sort of the what's called value names. Um, there's been a cutting down less exposure to healthcare, to US and to cash. Um, maybe kind of interesting to, to look at this and, and reflect on it a little bit. 
another one. Um, this is kind of when the when the fund managers were asked, what asset class do you think will outperform in 2021? And clearly the uh, by far biggest um, resp biggest consensus bet is on emerging markets. So we have a huge consensus for emerging markets sort of doing well in the next year. Uh, again, this is a fund manager survey. It's not our uh, view on it. You know, we take a more neutral view on the um, on the regions. Again, we look more at the companies, uh, and it also bears saying that the fund managers are not always right in their uh, predictions for for the coming year. The vaccine is going to be important. This is an interesting graph, kind of showing you. Um, to what extent the different countries in the world have contracted enough doses for their population. Every country in green, they have contracted 100% or more for their population. And you can see that that sort of covers most of the Western world. Uh, in emerging markets, you have you know, a bit of a mixed message in terms of you know, what is covered by the vaccine and, and um, uh, how smoothly the rollout happens or does not happen is obviously going to be uh, probably going to be hugely important for what's going to happen in the next year. As we've touched upon before, we have a uh, huge amount of negative yielding debt in the world. 17 trillion, the latest number. And interestingly, we just noticed that China came out here with the uh, sub-zero sovereign debt for the first time. Um, so again, this sort of trend that's been going on for many years continues, even though there seems now to be a bit of a consensus forming that in the market as a whole, that there might be some type of steepening of the yield curves from here. Um, but time will tell if that's, if that's tr true or, or, or not. Looking at different regions, and we're not going to sort of have time to go through our view of all the different regions. I'm just going to say a couple of words on each of the, the key ones, um, starting with Europe. And there are many things to say about Europe, but one interesting observation is that you have a lot of companies in Europe, you know, up on actually around 40% of the companies in the index, which make a low return on equity, so a sub 10% return on equity. Why does that matter? Well, it matters if you're long term, and of course valuation will play into it, but in general, a low return on equity does not bode well for <coughs> long term returns in, in many cases, uh, at least compared to what else might be available. So it also kind of goes to show why we think it's difficult, not impossible, but difficult to find a whole lot of interesting cases in the European market. We own a few names, for example, DSV, LVMH, you know, and a few and, and ASML and a few more. Uh, but overall, it is um, a market that looks challenging kind of to find these sort of good long time, uh, long term uh, names in. And um, given the political gridlock that we have in many European countries on the EU level, uh, it doesn't make us overly excited about Europe, even though the region will of course benefit if you have a cyclical trade, given that the index in Europe is, uh, has a high weight to cyclical companies. Moving on to Asia, again, Asia would take a long time to kind of go through. So we've just sort of summarized the view from, from UBS and their strategist who has sort of done a scorecard and summarizes the view here on different countries where you have those that are least attractive. You know, in, 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 in UBS's view, they are in red and the most attractive markets in Asia are in, in green. Uh, we often get the question of what do you think about the different countries in Asia? So we thought that we'll show this to give you a perspective from a from a reputable source. Uh, even though again, we, we may or may not agree. No, again, we don't take country views, so we're not endorsing it. Uh, we're just kind of showing that this is one view of uh, of the world uh, from a um, 
again from a uh, well-known source. Another debate that is going on is about the US market. Is it overvalued or is it undervalued? And the answer here, uh, the way we look at it, is uh, it depends. It depends on which multiple you're looking at, which metric you use to value the market. This is a PE, the kind of the, the um, uh, PE ratio. And if you look at the PE ratio currently, kind of in a snapshot in time, the market looks expensive. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's above one standard deviation. Now, one could argue that, that maybe the market is expecting earnings to come up in the next year. So, in fact, the PE might actually be lower if you take that into account. But again, uh, the, the headline PE makes the market look expensive. However, if you look on a cash flow basis, then the picture is different. Then we have the US market actually being undervalued. Maybe not by a whole lot, but at least you know, slightly below the long term average, which goes back in this graph all the way to 1984. Um, so the picture again is, is a bit ambivalent and you got to make up your mind you know, how you think about valuing uh, the, uh, the market. Our point of view, I mean, what is important is our index, which is the, uh, the uh, MSCI world all countries. And this graph shows you the uh, free cash flow yield valuation metric. So when we look at you know, if the market is over or undervalued, we prefer this metric because it is the cleanest metric, least affected uh, by different accounting uh, adjustments. And as most of you will know, um, the attribute of this valuation message means that the market is cheap when the free cash flow yield is high. Yeah, and um, by the same token, the market is expensive when the free cash flow yield is low. When we look at the average going back to 1995 until today, it is around 5%. Today, the market is trading at 5.7%. So it's actually slightly cheaper than the long term average. So that's kind of why we kind of come to the conclusion that we're in our view, the index is you know, reasonably priced and it helps us to believe that uh, when we look forward, there's a good opportunity or a good chance that we'll see attractive returns um, even kind of on, a, on a multi year view basis. Now, having gone through all of these sort of the macro things, ultimately what we come back to is the fact that the stock market is a market of stocks. Yeah. So again, from our point of view, we look at the stocks you know, one at a time, bottom up. And here is a sample of what we own in Skagen Global. You can see them group by kind of different themes. Um, uh, that that, know, that you can kind of be, be found in the portfolio. And we believe that these are, men, are sort of well positioned to, to help drive um, good returns, good performance uh, over the next few years. And with that, kind of we'll kind of jump into the, uh, the last section here about questions. Um, and I'll start with the first, they kind of fall into, the same category, can you comment about performance? Um, is the fund too heavily exposed to the US? And third, what about the falling US dollar? So for number one on the performance, I mean, I think we have we have talked about that that part, so not a whole more, lot more to, um, to add currently there. So we move on to the second and the third part about the US exposure. Now it's true that if you look at the fact sheet for Skagen Global, or you look in, I don't know, Morningstar or like some other publication, uh, the fund seems to have a high weight to the US market. The thing is that in most of these publications, if not all of them, the weight or the exposure is based on where a company is listed. Yeah, where does it trade in which country? And if you look at our portfolio, we take three names. We take Visa, Nike, and Abbott. They are all American companies. 
they trade in the US and they would be counted as 100% US in those tables that you see about Skagen Global's exposure. But the question is, is that the true way to look at, I mean, is that an accurate description? We would argue that that's a distorted picture of, of the actual exposure, because if you go in and you break it down um, by US and non-US based on where the company sells its products, where does it derive its revenue, its sales from, you can see that in all three cases, you have less than 50%, you know, more like an average of 40% coming from the US. And then by implication, 60% on average coming from outside the US. So if you only owned these three companies, and then you would claim that I have 100% exposure to the US, we would argue that that doesn't really tell you the right, I mean, that's not the right picture. What you have is, you know, this is a much more accurate view, we think, of what your actual exposure is. And that's what you should be looking at. But again, this is not published by most sort of in most fact sheets. So that's why it's important that we um, kind of highlight it and explain our reasoning uh, to you. Now, taking that to the whole portfolio, we've done that. And if you look at Skagen Global and you look at the company's 2018 revenues, and then you take a weighted average based on the position size of each company, you will see that Skagen Global has about 53% to North America, so that even includes a bit of Canada. 21% Europe, 25% Asia, rest of the world, which is obviously Asia, South America, a bit of uh, Australia and, and Africa. So the true underlying picture is a lot different from what you would see when you look at the headline number. And one reason we have come here is the fact that we like the Asian exposure, uh, but you know there are more difficulties with corporate governance in, 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 in Asia. So we have taken the view sometimes that it might be better to own a Western company that sells a lot of goods into Asia that will give you exposure to the Asian market but you will not get the same corporate governance risk. So it's kind of one thing that we have looked at. But again, we're also open to owning companies directly in, in Asia, in Europe, uh, if and when we find them. And just as a, kind of a bit of a comparison, it's not an apples to apples comparison um, because this is based on domicile, uh, but just to kind of show you the breakdown of the index, again, based on domicile, not sales to give you, you know, something to uh, to compare it to. So I kind of hope that answers sort of the, the US exposure that it is a lot lower than you would think. And what concerns the, um, the currency, um, we don't try to, we don't hedge any currencies. We don't try to predict currency movements. We don't try to project, you know, how they're gonna really impact the investment cases a lot because we think those variables are largely unpredictable. But if you look at, of course, this is a graph going back to 1980, the Euro US dollar exchange rate. I mean, we're not we're not too far off the long term average. We're actually pretty close to that one currently. So again, it doesn't look on this currency pair, at least, which is one of the main ones that the dollar is extremely over or undervalued. At the, at the current levels. Then we kind of had one, one uh, final question that was about the um, going back to that rotation that happened in the market, the catch up trade, the value rotation, how is going to what position to meet this type of style rotation toward value. Um, and just sort of a few words about this, um, starting out that that First, you have to define what do you mean by value? It's a loose sort of term which has many different meanings in the market. Some think of it as the morning source definition, which is sort of, you know, kind of based on the famous three by three matrix where you split up the index into different quadrants. Uh, we think that's too simplistic. We don't agree with this type of value index 
uh, that that's kind of you know they would be value to kind of buy the companies that Morningstar classifies as value, and I'll come back to why, namely the fact that um, what is in those boxes tend to be companies with low growth, low PE, low price to book. And as we have seen over the past decade or maybe even decades, those multiples are becoming increasingly relevant, irrelevant in the market because we've had this the digitalization, uh, a movement toward intangible assets. And in those cases, these traditional multiples don't really capture the underlying value in a good way, as we have talked about in, in other updates, meaning that you can't really rely on them to the same extent today as you could before. That means that we take kind of the same view as the world's most famous value investor, Warren Buffett. And I'm not, you can, I'm not going to read, but you can read kind of through here excerpts from his annual letters going back to 92, where he kind of lays out the case that value you know, is about paying something less than it's worth. And if you're going to have something be valuable and become more valuable over the long run, it has to have a bit of growth. I mean, the pie has to become bigger. Otherwise, there's not going to be much more value happening in there. And that's kind of the view that, that we take when we think about value. It also means that if you go back to this slide, which kind of names have benefited hugely from the value rotation, um, they are not necessarily kind of the ones that we think create a lot of value in the long term. And given that we focus on the long term and we don't try to trade in and out of the market in the short term, um, we, we are, you know, again, not going to have a lot of exposure to these type of names, given that they are, uh, for the most part, uh, incompatible with our investment uh, framework. So then to wrap up, before we take any additional questions, um, one thing, one uh, reflection, I mean, maybe not just from this year, but from the past few years is the fact that you know, the investment world, it is a lot about herd mentality and, and it's very easy to become part of the herd and it's, or put differently, it's hard to stand out. You know, you kind of tend to be pushed back again toward toward the middle and you know, where, where the average is, what people are used to, to seeing. Um, but if you think about that again and you look at some of the great entrepreneurs you know, who have succeeded in different fields, they tend to think differently and they act differently than than other people do. Yeah, doesn't mean you have to go completely crazy by any means, but of course you got to be something. You got, you got to do something a little bit different than what everybody else is is doing. And from our point of view, to again just kind of highlight the core concept of Skagen Global, is that we want to find the companies that can be in the portfolio for a long time and essentially kind of compound nicely in value over time. And one of the best examples is Samsung, which has been in the fund at least since uh, since the end of 98. And during that time period, the pref share has returned, you know, a staggering 23,000% um, uh, based in this is Norwegian Krona, but during that time, I mean, this is an, an, an amazing return, obviously. And you know, if you put it in context compared to the index, you can see, you know, how spectacular it has been. Of course, the journey hasn't been linear. It has been ups and downs. Some periods can be multi years when things kind of go against you. But over time, it has been it has been an, an, a fantastic journey. And we hope that we could find more companies like this that we can put in a portfolio and then the portfolio can essentially, you know, move forward slowly but surely over time, grind higher. And we think that's one of the best way to, to beat the index deliver uh, excess return. It's not the only way. I mean, there are other ways to win, but this is a f the philosophy that we have been preaching uh, for, for a long time. So oh, with that, I'll kind of end here, uh, go over to questions and um, uh, be, yeah, 
take any any comments or questions that might have been submitted. So I'll turn it back to Ole Christian. Thank you very much indeed, Knut, for that thorough market update. We have a question actually. Um, uh, what is your attitude towards smaller company exposure, Knut? Yeah, I mean, our attitude. There are a few things to <clears throat> to comment on. I mean, number one is is um, uh, there is some limits given that we have you know a decent size size fund uh, around 30 billion NOC. So it can't be too small uh, because it is just the, the liquidity constraints. Uh, so that's maybe one thing on the negative side. On the positive side, of course, if you can find a small company that you think has the the competitive edge, you know, a reasonable valuation and fits the framework overall that can grow for a long time, that could make small companies very attractive. If we can find those companies, we are more than happy to to own them in the fund. And actually, even if they were to be a little bit illiquid, we can own a few of those companies. I mean, that would be that would be OK from a risk management point of view. Um, but of course, you got to be sure that, that you have that competitive advantage in the company. Given that they're small, they usually have a shorter um, history to look at. Um, so that's kind of got to be, be balanced. And small companies, I mean, they still need to have, from our perspective, good cash flow. I mean, we're not we're not trying to buy companies without, you know, earnings you know, that are just kind of very highly valued. Uh, you know, we need to find companies that are somewhat established uh, in their in their field. But we're open to that, and and uh, we have had companies that have been uh, down to a size of about two billion dollars and even less actually, and we can come back to that. Uh, so again, we have an unconstrained mandate and we are um, certainly open to, to owning uh, the right small companies if we can find them.